Science. Engineering. Medicine. Yes, chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanities. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global health. Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, my goodness, are we actually having a summer? I think we might be. So, in our sunniest, summeriest way, we're off to this year's Summer Science Exhibition at the Royal Society. Lots of culture there, but we might not be alone in that regard in having some kind of culture because there's evidence in this edition of animals learning from each other too. In humans, traditions often last for a very long time. In animals, it's very hard to get data about how long-lasting traditions might be. And so we were able to use these new methods to make inferences about that and find that swamp sparrow song traditions are sort of a similar order of stability to human cultural traditions. And we join a school group learning physics by experimenting with sounds from space. Well, first, let's jump in with some news. Ryan O'Hare is here. And uh, Ryan, we're going to start by talking about physical activity and exercise and a suggestion that it might be best to leave the car at home and and take the train instead when we're commuting. Yes, so inactivity is a huge problem and it's thought to contribute to millions of deaths around the world each year. The World Health Organization actually advises that we should all be getting around 30 minutes of physical exercise a day, even a brisk walk. But in England, almost 40% of adults are failing to hit this target. But researchers from the School of Public Health here at Imperial think that public transport could help. In a recent study analysis of public transport use in England, a team led by Dr Anthony Laverty found that more than half of people who take the train every day manage to hit this 30 minutes of activity. How do the researchers think that that might help them? They basically looked at questionnaire responses from across England and around three and a half thousand people. People, when they were doing this questionnaire, they filled out diaries of this sort of activity that they logged on their their day-to-day journeys. And what they found is that more than half of people who took the train managed to hit this 30-minute target of activity compared to just 21% of bus users. So the group explained that taking public transport every day could actually be a good way to incorporate just a little bit extra activity into daily life and this could help to stave off some of the negative health effects of our sedentary lifestyles. I think we should all take note. Ryan O'Hare, thank you very much indeed for that. Hayley Dunning is here. Now what's all this about bacteria that I've been hearing and reading that they have a rather smart approach, an intelligent approach almost to warfare, battles amongst the bugs. Yeah, you wouldn't imagine that they can do such sophisticated things, but a lot of bacteria actually can release toxins that can harm or even kill other species of bacteria. And this is going on all the time sort of in our guts, the bacteria communities in our guts and also in infections and things like that. But some release toxins not just to kill their competitors, but to provoke them into an aggressive response. So in response, these other bacteria up their release of toxins. So for a given species of bacteria, how might this mechanism, this incredible mechanism, be either like good or possibly bad? Well, the researchers tried it out with a few different communities and they found that if there's just two communities, the one doing the provoking, it's kind of, it's a bad idea. They get strong retaliation from the other bacteria and they get kind of wiped out. But if there are two other bacteria communities that they're fighting against and provoking, they provoke each other to attack each other and wipe each other out, leaving the provoker to just clear up. <laughs> like As in so many things in life, I'm sure. Which, of course, is fascinating in itself. It's really good that we know this. But what uses might it have? So it could be used as another strategy for tackling bacterial communities. So one is in biofilms. So biofilms are sort of communities of bacteria that that foul things like water pipes. They build up these big sticky masses. But also, really interestingly, in infections, say in lung infections, there are a lot of different kinds of bacteria in there. And if we could sort of put in some chemical that provokes this provoking reaction, then we could get the bacteria to wipe each other out. Wow, Hayley, thank you so much for that insight into those amazingly clever bacteria, endlessly clever and uh, inventive bacteria. Okay, so it's July. And that must mean it's that annual treat, the Royal Society's Summer Science Exhibition. Now, by the time you hear this, the event will have just finished. So sorry. But fear not if you couldn't get there, because on our behalf, Caroline Brogan did. 
I'm here at the 2018 Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition and very summery it is indeed outside today but inside it's also scorching with science. Oh, this is officially different. So I'm here with Dr Arash Mustafi who is going to talk me through his Code for Creation stand. Hi Dr Mustafi, can you just take me through what you have on show here? Welcome to the Royal Society and our exhibit Code for Creation. So Code for Creation is really about materials, materials that are used in modern technologies. And it's called Code for Creation because what we do is we model materials, we do theory and simulation of materials using computer code on supercomputers. So these are computers with lots and lots of processing units in order to understand, design and optimize materials for technological applications. So what kind of applications are you looking at? In the research groups involved in theory and simulation of materials at Imperial, there are all sorts of applications that, that are studied. The ones that we're showcasing here can include uh, using two-dimensional materials, such as graphene being the most popular one, to make sensors and transistors, and also in uh, nuclear fusion reactors, looking at how we can study how the materials used on the inside of the reactor, things like the tungsten and the steel alloys that are used inside the reactor in very harsh conditions, <laughs> how they damaged by the radiation, how that damage can be healed by annealing. So by heating up the material and healing the damage caused by the radiation in, in this very harsh environment. Have you had much sort of interest in the stand? Have you had any really interesting questions or debates? Yeah, so one of the things people are very interested in is the supercomputers that we use to run our simulations. So as part of the Thomas Young Center, which is the London Center for Theory and Simulation of Materials, of which Imperial is a part, we have national supercomputer facility. And the supercomputer that's at the center of that facility is called Thomas. And it has about 17,000 computer cores. And we use this machine to do our simulations. And there's been quite a of interest in Thomas. I'm now here with Dr. Hai T. Lin from Bioengineering, who's going to talk to me about his dragon wings and how he's using them to inspire wings on aeroplanes. Can you just talk me through what you're doing here? Okay, so uh, insect wings are actually not a uh, static structure. It has a lot of sensors on, on top, so it can sense the airflow as they fly. And they're using this sensory feedback to control their flight, so they can deal with turbulence. We aim to inspire a new generation of wind turbine blades, as well as aircraft wings, so they can deal with turbulence as well. What are you showing us here? So we've got like a large wing with lights on it and a piston at the end. What are you showing us with this? The LED lights on the wing represent some of the sensor you will find on the inside wing. And as you move the wing up and down, as if you're flapping, you'll see the pattern of lighting change. And that represents how the sensor reacts to aerodynamic load. So I'm talking to some of the students from Charters. How are you finding the exhibition? Uh, it's really exciting. It's such a great opportunity. And it's also really interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, there are many other exhibits here as well. So it's interesting to see what everyone's doing that's different to us. Yeah, it's so fun. It's weird how pond dipping that you probably did when you were young is now scientific. So you feel kind of cool doing all the science stuff. It's fun yeah, to get your I toes into that. some real science. <laughs> nice being part of something that's actually contributing to the world. Yep, my thoughts entirely. Some visitors and indeed some exhibitors there at this year's Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. Caroline Brogan reporting. Well now, can members of some animal species learn from each other? The answer is yes. We've known that for some time actually. But can animals create and sustain cultural traditions? Well, that's a bit more complicated to answer. But now some fresh insights come from research in certain species of sparrows. A study in populations of swamp sparrows has shown that some have been singing the same songs for potentially hundreds of years. Imperial researchers working with others have broken the songs into their component parts and they found that they're basically just a single syllable that's repeated. About a quarter of the bird song syllables recorded in the field are likely to be older than 500 years old. Hayley Dunning has been listening to some of these especially enduring songs and also speaking to Dr Robert Lachlan of the School of Biological and Chemical Sciences at Queen Mary University of London and also Dr Oliver Ratman of the Math Department here at Imperial. And Hayley's first question to Oliver, how are the birds able to do this? What we found is that these swamp sparrows are 
remarkable learners. So per generation, uh, 98% of syllables are, are learned correctly. That's what we estimate. And the second part was that they had this additional learning strategy so that they were focusing on, on learning the songs that were more common in the population. And they did this preferentially. They were conforming to the cultural norms or the cultural preferences in terms of the dialect that existed in the local population. We refer to this as a conformist bias in the study. So how exactly did you carry out the study? Well, the, the first step was not very glamorous and involved a lot of mud. I sampled these six populations across the northeast of the US from New York State through to Wisconsin. And basically, over a couple of springs, spent each morning getting up early, wandering into marshes and recording the songs of the swamp sparrows in between getting bitten by every every insect under the sun. The, the way that we can do that is we know that when they're singing during the breeding season, they're singing to defend a territory, and each territory is only about 50 metres across. That. There's a little chunk of the marsh that each male will defend. So if you go to a particular spot and record a male singing there for a, around an hour, you'll know you've got that male's repertoire. And then if you move over to the next territory, you'll know that you're recording a different male. So... By doing that, we're able to record a sample of the complete song repertoires of around 600 different males from these six populations. And then the next step was to use a computational method that I developed to compare and classify these different songs into to types. It's a method that's sort of derived from an algorithm that was originally developed for speech recognition. And applying this to the, the data, we're able to classify all of those songs across the 600 song repertoires. So more than 3,000 songs, we were able to classify them into 160 different types. So what we're doing is we're simulating how syllables evolved over time. And the simulation output, we could match then to the syllables that we identified from the empirical data after all this pre-processing and all the data cleaning. And so this is how we were able to link up something as complicated and complex as birdsong to, to computer simulations. So I know you've bought a One Sparrow's repertoire for us to give a listen to. Can you tell us a bit more about these recordings? Right. So these are the three different songs that one male from the Hudson Valley population in the study sang. So this population was from a marsh about 100 miles north of New York City. This male sang three song types, and one of the songs was very common, was sung by around 50 males in that, in our sample from that population, so about half of the males in that population. One of the songs was just sung by a few males in the population. And the other song, as far as we know, was only sung by this male. So that represents a possible example of, of a mutation or innovation in singing. So he's trying something new, but it probably won't work out. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's the probable truth of it. But the other songs might get him through his life happily. But one thing that everyone always asks for this study is surely that there must be some benefit to innovating or coming up with something new. I mean, as humans, that's a very natural thing, that the, you might stand out from the crowd or be more attractive by singing something just a little bit different from everybody else. But everything that we found in this study points to the fact that they're trying to learn as, as accurately as possible and to conform to the norms of the population. The rates of change that we found are really only consistent with them occasionally making mistakes. How remarkable is this ability and this cultural tradition in these birds? We now know that many species of animals have an ability to learn from each other. So something that was thought to be very human 30 or 40 years ago is now thought to be very widespread, everything from bumblebees to fish to birds, as in this case. It's a little bit less clear the degree to which animals can have really stable cultural traditions like us as a result of learning from each other. That, in a way, is something that our study addresses, this link between the individual learning behavior, learning from each other precisely, and how that relates to the stability of traditions over time. Whereas in, in humans, traditions often last for a very long time. In animals, it's very hard to get data about how long-lasting traditions might be. And so we were able to use these new methods to make inferences about that and find that swamp sparrow song traditions are sort of a similar order of stability to human cultural traditions. Robert Lachlan and Oliver Ratman talking there to Hayley Dunning. 
Well, finally, it's DJing with a cosmological twist, mixing up the sounds of the universe in a workshop that fuses science with music. That's been just one experience recently in a series of workshops designed to bring physics alive for school children in London. The workshops have been to four secondary schools across the capital and are a collaboration between the Royal Albert Hall and Imperial's outreach team. Reporting from one event on the sounds of space, here's our new reporter, Joanna Wilson. In space, no one can hear you. So I'm here with Hannah, an Imperial Physics student. So what are you doing here today? Today we're looking at the sounds of the universe. So we've got um, some sounds which are made by different objects in the universe, for example black holes, cosmic microwave background radiation, and uh, the students here are making their own tunes using those sounds. In space no one can hear you scream, but it's scientifically correct. Why is it scientifically correct? There's That's no one of the workshop hosts, the Mike, from the Royal Albert Hall, telling the group about the basics of sound. Something called a longitudinal wave. Anyone heard of the word longitudinal? Right. Could we say it rhythmically? Could it go longitudinal? Go longitudinal. Hey, one, two, three, four. Not all physical concepts were honoured with their own song, but Hannah went on to explain electromagnetic radiation by discussing what matter has in common with anyone who just wants to sit around and be lazy. If you heat matter up, the matter is really lazy and it thinks, I don't want to have to be moving around fast, so it tries to get rid of its extra energy, and it gets rid of it by giving off light or electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so that's what the sun does, and that's what, well, everything does really. You guys are giving off electromagnetic radiation now. But as well as light, there was also plenty of sound as space became musical. Um, so basically just doing, like, we're just pressing random buttons, trying to make like, some random noises that actually can sound realistic. But sometimes it just sounds fake. Because sometimes we think that they don't exist, and they do. And I just think it's awesome. So what sounds are you using here? No idea. <laughs> Where have they come from? From space. <laughs> it's literally just like music. Why do you think it's important for science students to come to schools um, and do workshops like this? Uh, I think the universe is just the most incredible thing and we need to get as many people out there aware of what's going on and just hopefully open kids' eyes and realise how cool the universe actually is. Wow, I love those sounds. They're so eerie and ethereal. That report was from Joanna Wilson. Joanna, welcome to the team. And that's it for this edition. Just the usual reminders before I go and leave you in peace. If you want to catch up with what's been going on around the college in the news department on the news side of things, then do go to our news website. Funny enough, it's imperial.ac.uk slash, yes, guess what, news. And on Twitter, we are at Imperial Spark. I can also confirm and tell you that my name is Gareth Mitchell. You probably know that by now if you're a regular. Uh, but I'll be back in a few weeks' time with our next podcast. Until then, have a great few weeks and I'll see you soon. Take care, folks, and goodbye. <laughs>